Life Church, thank you for joining us online today. In the next following weeks, we'll be discussing several critical issues we're facing today through this series called But God. We're going to be examining some of these issues not from a political or a popular point of view, but through the lens of the Word of God. As a reminder, you can download a sermon outline for this message by clicking on the description box below, or you can go on our website's homepage and click on Download Sermon Outline. Now, stay tuned for some worship. Good morning, church. It's so good to be with you today. If you can, where you're at, will you just stand with me and let's worship together. Come on, sing this with me. I can see. I can see the promised land. Know this pain within your plan. There is victory in the end. Your love is my battle cry. When my fears like Jericho, build the walls around my soul. When my heart is overthrown, your love is my battle cry. The anthem for all my life. And every giant will fall. The mountains will move every chain of the past. You've broken into over fear, over lies. We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible with you. There is hope within the fight, in the wars that rage inside. Oh, those shadows feel the light. Your love is my battle cry. Oh, it's the anthem for all my life. And every giant will fall. The mountains will move every chain of the past. You've broken into all the fear, all the lies. We're singing the truth and nothing is impossible. Mm-hmm. 
and everything else can wait. I'll come to seek your face, and everything else can wait. I'm here for you. I want to just be here at your feet. Just be here on my knees. Here in your presence, I am complete, Jesus. Everything else can wait And I've come to seek your face And everything else can wait I'm here for you And I want to
Good morning. I'd like to welcome you today. I pray that you've been having a wonderful week. It's been beautiful weather. Uh, my family and I, we had the opportunity of being, going camping for, for a week. And so uh, we were out with nature, had our campfires, and just had a, had a great time. I think all of us need that time of decompression. Today we're going to continue in our series, But God. In this series, we're going to be talking about race in the Bible today. Our culture is rapidly changing like never before. There are many points of contention that fill our headlines, social feeds, and conversations. The church has a history of neglecting or mismanaging cultural issues. We often conform and compromise or withdraw and isolate. But Jesus didn't shy away from uncomfortable topics nor did he respond in hate. Instead, he spoke to the culture with both clarity and compassion. And so should you and I as followers. So how do we do that? What do you say? In the middle of all that's happening around us, there's raw racial pain, bitterness, anger, and hostility in our country and in our community. That's why many pastors hesitate to preach on it. Why do you say, or what do you say, as a preacher of the gospel? How do you stand in the pulpit or stream a message in the face of unrest, turmoil, and heartache? How do you speak of injustice and of grace? If you're a preacher these days, you've asked that question. Some have chosen to ignore it, turn a blind eye, and stick to the preaching plan laid out, and trust that it all blew over eventually. Some believe it's a political issue and not a spiritual or a theological issue and try to be careful to not politicize the preaching moment. Too many of us have been burned by congregations not ready to hear a prophetic word in the midst of a tragedy. So it seems safer to wait, but our society needs a prophetic voice who clearly is saying, this is God's truth. When I'm talking about what the Bible says about racism, I'm taking on a prophetic role, speaking from God in a society that needs to hear it. One of the reasons I am so compelled to preach on this controversial issue is because the church has largely been silent on this topic. But my motives are deeper than that. I want us to be like a group of people called the men of Issachar. Listen to what is said about them in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32 who had the understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Now, the context is the time period between Saul's leadership and David's reign. It was in the midst of upheaval and uncertainty. They understood their culture. The word understood or understanding means to have skilled insight. It's important for us to have insight into what's going on in our society. Uh, this word also has the idea of turning away from evil. We must not cave into our culture, but instead live counterculturally. They also engaged in their culture. They knew what Israel ought to do. This phrase refers to a moral obligation or a purposeful response. We must be engaged with people, not enraged at them, moving from understanding to action. God is calling us to revolutionary love, not reactionary hate. We've analyzed and now we're going to act. We're urged to discern our culture and then we must deploy into our culture as ambassadors of Christ. Here's a simple prayer. Lord, help me to understand my culture and then enable me to engage with people in order to share the gospel. I realize I'll probably offend someone today because I won't say something totally right, and I'm sure I'll leave out some things that should have been said. Prejudice, discrimination, segregation, racism. Our society cries out against such offenses as it should. Prejudice judges a man's character by his outward appearance. It seems ironic that the differences between the races are exaggerated when brown and pink people are labeled black and white. 
Those very terms themselves begin to polarize our thinking between two extremes, rather than emphasizing the closeness of the two. They emphasize the differences in people rather than the similarities. Having said all that, I'm not afraid to jump in and see what God's Word has to say. Three weeks ago in our But God series, we tackled what is truth. Two weeks ago was about social justice. And last week was the sanctity of life. That's quite a lineup, isn't it? My aim is to not be politically correct, but biblically correct. We can't be silent when God has spoken, can we? Pastors must not be cowards in the pulpit and to simply think of racism as a temporary crisis that will eventually fade away, but instead as a sinful reality that will remain until Jesus returns. Sometimes we look to the wrong places for answers. A lot of times we look at the current event kind of magazines when really the true answers are in this book, the Bible. I think we can get some good information from current events, but the real answers are here. You can look at Time magazine, but this, the Bible, is timeless. This is why we want to look into God's Word. You can look at U.S. News, but I'd rather look at the good news. This is really where the difference is. You can look at Sports Illustrated, but I'd rather look at God Illustrated. Now, here's how God wants to work in people's lives. And that's who Jesus is. God showing us the kind of attitudes and kinds of actions that we should have. So, let's ask the question, does the Bible, the Bible, talk about racism? Let's start with a definition of what today we call racism. I like the one that John Piper adopted in his excellent book, Bloodlines, Race, Cross, and the Christian. Quote, Racism is an explicit or implicit belief or practice that uh, qualitatively distinguishes or values one race over other races. Or to say it more closely or more simply, the heart that believes one race is more valuable than another is a sinful heart. And the behavior that distinguishes one race as more valuable than another is a sinful behavior. As you and I Look at this topic, it's something all of us began facing way back on the playground. It really begins in kindergarten, although kids don't really understand. It's like, you're different from me. You're you're black. You're white. Your your eyes are different. Uh, Those are statements that maybe kindergartners state. Uh, They have noticed differences, and those differences too often become a reason for pulling us apart from putting people apart. Martin Luther King Jr. said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. At its core, racism says, I'm better than you. I have more worth than you. A racist heart ends up dehumanizing those who are different from them. My approach today is to walk through some key passages in the Bible in order to catch God's heart for unity within diversity and his desire to encircle all ethnicities into his church. The Bible has an answer for all issues we face in lives. Just as we have during this But God series, let's once again turn to the Word of God and view this issue through this lens. In Genesis, we're reminded in Genesis 1.27 that everyone is created in the image of God and therefore has great worth. In fact, it says, quote, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them, end of quote. The Imago Dei, or the image of God, has been stamped on every human being. Physical differences and ethnic distinctions are secondary to being made in the image of God. The late Rabbi Zacharias nails it when he said, The reason we are against racism is because a person's race is sacred. A person's ethnicity is sacred. You cannot violate it. C.S. Lewis put it this way, You've never met a mere mortal. 
or as H.G. Wells said, our true nationality is mankind. You see, we are of various ethnicities, but only one race. In that sense, Ken Ham is right when he says that the only race is the human race. We're all ultimately children of Adam and Eve, so we're all related. So God's word is clear. There's only one race. Acts 17, 26 reads, And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. We can talk about people groups, but only with the understanding that these groups represent what the Bible refers to as tribes or nations. People do have ethnic and cultural heritages that can be honored, should be honored, and celebrated. But we are all one blood. Even in the midst of our differences, we are all the same. In Genesis chapter 3, we see that sin enters the world and disharmony and disease and disunity are unleashed. But we need to still remember that even fallen sinful man has the status of being in God's image and must be treated with dignity and respect that's due God's image bearers. The human race multiplies, and if you fast forward to Genesis chapter 11, everyone in the world is speaking the same language, and a group of people decide to build a tower to the heavens known as the Tower of Babel. Verse 4 tells us that they want to make a name for themselves, and they didn't want to be scattered over the earth. In verse 7, we read that God confused their language and scattered them over the face of the earth. In Genesis 12, God calls Abram and makes a covenant with him, promising him in verse 3 that through him all the families of the earth will be blessed. God makes it clear in his unfolding revelation that while he called the Israelites to himself, his plan was for them to be the light to the nations around them. In Psalm 67, 3, it reads, God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. God blessed Israel so that they would be a blessing to the cultures around them. God cares for people with different ethnicities like, like, like Rahab and Ruth and, and even the Ninevites as seen in the book of Jonah. Unfortunately, for the most part, the Jews became proud of their status and instead of reaching out, they ended up despising the Gentiles. The prophet Micah proclaims a vision of a promised community made up of people from diverse backgrounds and cultures. In Micah 4, 2, many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. And in Amos 5, 24, we read this, But let justice run down like water, and righteousness like a mighty stream. When we get to the Gospels, let me point out, Jesus is saying with his coming, a radically new way of defining the people of God is here, namely faith in him. Faith in Jesus trumps ethnicity. In Luke 10.33, Jesus holds up the Good Samaritan, a hated mixed cultural background, as the hero in a story about compassionate neighboring. And then in Mark 7, 26, he heals the daughter of a Syrophoenician who is part of a mixed tribal people group. When he drove the money changers out of the temple, he said this in Mark eleven seventeen, 17, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And when Jesus gave his final commission to his followers who were all from the same cultural background, he told them to cross cultures and continents. Matthew 28, 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. When we come to the book of Acts, Jesus again clarifies that the gospel is for everyone. In Acts 1.8, you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And in Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, Babel is reversed. 
when the Holy Spirit is poured out on all peoples from different languages. Check out this list of culturally diverse people in Acts chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia and Judea, and Kaposha and Pontus and Asia and Persia and Pamphylia and Egypt and the parts of Libya joining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongue the wonderful works of God. In Acts 6, the new church made up of those from a Jewish culture and those from other cultures had some conflict because Greek-speaking widows were being neglected. They made some adjustments and accommodations in order to keep the ethnically diverse congregation together by appointing seven deacons. In Acts 8, Philip, a white Greek guy, preaches the gospel to a black Ethiopian, and he gets saved immediately is baptized. Then in Acts 10, Peter, who was Jewish and held to Old Testament dietary laws, is doing his 2020 through the Bible reading, and he has a vision where heavens open up and a huge bed sheet descends in front of him. In the sheet are all sorts of animals that were considered unclean and forbidden food for the Jewish person. God speaks into Peter, having to repeat himself three times because Peter is so hesitant. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter refuses, and in verse 15, he hears this voice. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. Verse 28, reveal the battle going on in Peter's heart as he greets a room full of Romans. You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company or to go to one of another nation. You see, Peter's way out of his comfort zone. But we see his willingness to change. But God, but God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. God gave Peter this object lesson because the very next person he spoke to was a man from another culture, a hated culture, a hated Roman military officer named Cornelius. Peter finally gets it, puts it aside, his ethnic superiority, when he says these words in Acts 10, 34, in truth. I perceive that God shows no partiality. Drop down to verse 43. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. In Acts 15, the early church had its first major dispute. It wasn't over the color of carpeting or music styles. The conflict was actually cultural because the gospel was exploding among different ethnic groups. Ethnically diverse congregations were causing Jewish background Christ followers to have coronaries. The church in Jerusalem has its first business meeting and votes to not make non-Jewish people become Jewish in order to follow Jesus. Everyone can maintain their own ethnicity and cultural distinctiveness and yet be enfolded into one radically diverse community called the church. When this decision was written down and circulated in a letter, people from different ethnic and cultural backgrounds, according to verse 31, rejoiced over its encouragement. Later on, Peter enjoys his newly found food freedom, and he's eating uh, bacon-wrapped little Smokies with some Greek guys at a Super Bowl party. He's having a good time even though the Seahawks aren't playing. But when some Jewish background Jesus followers find out Peter stuffs his bacon under the couch cushion and attempts to go to back to the old rules and his racist heart. Friends, because of our sinfulness, we always drift back to homogeny. Barnabas has an epic failure also in Galatians 2. Paul calls both of them out, confronting them publicly because it's such a big deal. Listen to verse 14. If you being a Jew... Live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews. Why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? Friends, we must call racism out when we see it as well. Paul sets the record straight in Galatians 3.28 when he says that unity in Christ trumps racial superiority. 
There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The gospel of grace trumps race. Ephesians 2, 14 through 16 hammers this home as we hear God's vision for a reconciled community. For he himself is our peace, who has broken both one, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, therefore putting to death the enmity. Jesus Christ has restored and reconciled the races. There are no longer two or ten or twenty or two, twenty thousand. There's now one. Before Jesus, there were two ethnic groups on earth. There was the Jews and the Gentiles. After his resurrection and ascension, a new ethnic group was formed, made up of Jews and Gentiles, called the One New Man, or the Church. The idea of races calls us to ask a serious question. If there are different races, then which race did Christ die for? The answer has eternal consequences. All human beings are related. We all can trace our ancestry back to the first man, Adam. As descendants of Adam, we are all sinners. As sinners, we are all in need of a Savior. Jesus Christ, the last Adam, was born as a man, as a descendant of Adam. Because of this birth, he was able to serve as our Redeemer. He was crucified, died, and rose again. He overcame death. And those who put their faith and trust in him need not fear death, for they inherit eternal life. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. The Bible says that Jesus Christ has broken down all the walls of separation, made everyone one. Everyone has full and complete access. The Greek word for one means new kind, unprecedented, novel. John Piper says it this way in his book, Bloodlines, racial harmony is a blood issue, not just a social issue. The bloodline of Jesus Christ is deeper, deeper than bloodlines of race. James 2.9, but if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. I love the picture of multiple people, groups, praising together in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. Worthy are you to take the scroll and open it. For you were slain by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nations. Revelation 7, verses 9 through 10, gives us even more detail. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, and peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. Our worship down here is but a dress rehearsal for worship up there, when all reconciled races will gather around the throne to worship the Lamb who was slain. Every, quote, race must recognize we are all created in the image of God, having an intelligent mind, male and female, different skin tones, likes and dislikes. We all have experienced racism, but it's how we choose to respond and how others and our youth are observing our actions all the time. We must be the example and not the reason racism continues to exist. The bloodline of Jesus Christ is dip, deeper than the bloodlines of race. The death and resurrection of the Son of God for sinners is the only sufficient power to bring the bloodlines of race into the single bloodline of the cross. God didn't sketch creation in black and white. He illustrated it on a canvas of colors. The idea of color blindness comes from good intentions, but what it essentially communicates is forget about where you came from. Forget about your family and forget 
how God made you. The answer to racism is not found in running to government and making more laws, but in running to our neighbors of all colors and gaining more understanding so that we can call out racism whenever it rears its ugly anti-gospel head. Regarding what the church should be doing, it should be listening. Again, a quote by Martin Luther King, Jr. I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless midnight of racism and war that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become a reality. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word, end of quote. Here's the bottom line. Grace must affect how we look at race. The problem is not the color of the skin. The problem is the condition of the heart. And only Jesus Christ can fix that. True Life Fellowship is ethnically and racially diverse, yet harmonious and united. This is a place of grace for discussions about race. We come together no matter our skin color or background. We grow together because we can't grow alone. We give to each other because of what we've been given. And we go with the gospel to people who are different from us because the dividing wall of hostility has been knocked down by the gospel. That includes the nations living next door as God has brought the nations to us from around the world. An NFL player named Benjamin Watson had this to say after the Ferguson verdict, after expressing that he has been Angry, frustrated, fearful, embarrassed, sad, sympathetic, offended, confused, and hopeless. He also said he was hopeful. And then he said this, I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged because ultimately the problem is not a skin problem, it's a sin problem. Sin is the reason we rebel against authority. Sin is the reason we abuse our authority. Sin is the reason we are racist, prejudiced and lie to cover for our own. Sin is the reason we riot, loot and burn. But I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged because God has provided a solution for sin through His Son, Jesus, and with it, a transformed heart and mind. One that's capable of looking past the outward and seeing what's truly important in every human being. The cure for tragedies is not education or exposure. It's the gospel. I'm encouraged because the gospel gives mankind hope. Shall we pray? Father, I'm so thankful for you, the creator of all. Father, in, uh, in the midst of unrest, turmoil, questioning, pain, anxiety, Lord, in the midst of life, Father, you speak hope. You've given us your Son, Jesus Christ. Today I pray, Lord, that you would bring a comfort to those that need comforting. God, that you would bring answers to those that need answers. But God, most of all, I pray that you would show yourself real in people's lives today. And that as we seek you, you would be found. And Lord, as a mother hen calls her chicks to her and then wraps her wings around those chicks to protect them, Father, I pray, Lord, for your protection. I pray for your comfort. Lord, I pray that you would be everything that we need, because you are. And the Lord, we would call upon you in our time of need. And Father, that we would find Find the answers, find the solutions that only come from you, that ultimately will bring peace and harmony to the chaos that we see around us today. I pray your blessing upon those that have heard this message today. Father, let us find our encouragement in you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you for listening today. I pray that you have a, have a wonderful day and a great week. God bless you.
the refuge You have no borders When I was a stranger knocking on your door You took me in With no questions And no conditions When I was a sinner running from your grace You called me friend you call me friend Never know how sight is to your own. We are all welcome this grace enough When I have wandered, Lord The cross is the open door There are no outsiders I'm not in the side to your love Cause you are the harbor and every tempest When my soul was shipwrecked tossed upon the waves you calmed the storm And you are the father There are no Every tribe and nation gathered in your arms Sing with one voice Sing with one voice Cause there are no outsiders to your love We are all welcome as grace enough And when I have wandered, Lord The cross is the only I was tired, I was poor, I was thrown upon your shores, I was homeless and afraid, until I heard you call my name, and now I'm ransomed, I'm restored, resurrected, I am yours, I am loved, yes I belong, oh my soul has found its home. There are no outsiders to your love. We are all welcome this grace enough. And when I have wandered, Lord, the cross is the open door. There are no outsiders. Oh, I'm not an outsider. Cause there are no outsiders. There are no outsiders to your love. We are all welcome this grace enough. When I have wandered, Lord, the cross is the open door. There are no outsiders. And I'm not an outsider to your Thank you for listening to that message. We know how difficult it may be to process some of the heavy topics and issues we're talking about here in this series. The Holy Spirit has spoken specific things to your heart. It's possible that you have questions that you would like further discussion on. 
If so, we really encourage you to reach out to one of our pastors or leaders who are available and would love to have an open dialogue with you. Just simply go to our website at www.tlfchurch.com connect, or you can send us a text at 323-389-7006. Remember, you can give online through our website, or you can send in your tithes and offerings by mail. You can find all the info on how to do that by going to www.tlfchurch.com online dash giving. Thank you so much for your continual support during this time. We want to let you know that we have our Kids Church Online that meets on a weekly basis through our secured Google Classroom. If you're interested in our Kids Church Online platform, please visit our TLF Online page. Click on the Kids Church Sign Up button to connect with one of our leaders. On Sunday nights, our prayer team is committing one hour of prayer from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. If you have any prayer requests or praise report, you can leave us a message on our TLF online page, or you can send us an email at prayer at tlfchurch.com or send us a text at 323-389-7006. On Wednesday nights, we have our midweek unplugged Bible study at 7 p.m. in which a new devotional will be posted on our website. Join us for this amazing study on the Book of Luke. We thank you for joining us online today. We hope that you are blessed, encouraged, and challenged through that message. Hit like, subscribe, feel free to share this video with others. We love you. We thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again next time. God bless.